Aloha, this is Darlene Red Triggs, your host for Making Waves, a show about peace and social justice in Hawaii. Um, this is the second installment on Faith and Service of a Conscientious Objector, Part 2, with Logan Mayo Laturi talking about conscientious objecting ob and war. And uh, we're going to start this segment about the Truth Commission on Conscience and War with a little trailer of the upcoming March Commission. There will be times when nations will find the use of force not only necessary, but morally justified. What is your duty? Kill! Kill! Kill without As a soldier? As a human being? You have to ask yourself, in what situations would killing be right? We were in the area of Iraq that was supposed to be where the Garden of Eden, you know, where mankind began. I had to ask myself, why am I carrying around an M16 in the Garden of Eden? When are there situations in which loyalty to a nation state comes into conflict with loyalty to the kingdom of God? I felt very strongly that Christians can serve their country, they first and foremost must serve the God that they worship. There is a weight to what you're doing. War in all situations is a grave atrocity. And I only know that because I stepped foot in those countries overseas. Most of the American people haven't. So that's why they should listen to us, because we've been there. Again, that was the trailer for the Truce Commission on Conscience in War, which will happen on March 23rd in New York City. I have with me Logan Mail Laturi, who will be speaking at that Truce Commission, and who will give us a little bit of context and background to that. Um, thank you for coming, Logan. Um, again, at the last um, part one, we left off, um, I think, on a really interesting note in terms of you not being able to talk about your service in Iraq um, your previous service in Iraq while you were there in January. So now here's an opportunity for you to speak out and um, just please give us a little bit of context and background for this Truth Commission. Why is it important and what you hope to accomplish by going there? Sure. Um, when I applied to be a CO in uh, June of 06, um, the whole process was self-taught. I didn't know anybody else who did it. I, I stumbled upon the regulation that uh, contained the instructions. And if I hadn't plugged into uh, certain groups and uh, been in certain circles, it would have been an incredibly lonely experience. Um, and uh, so all the different uh, branches of the armed forces have uh, stipulations for COs, um, including the Coast Guard. The DOD even has one at uh, uh, the Department of Defense level. Oh, and, uh, but the problem is there is a lack of understanding of them, but also the only uh, only strict pacifism is recognized currently in our in, in the U.S. Furthermore, because it's not federal uh, law, mm -hmm. the military regulations in the UCMJ can be rescinded at any time, which is what happened in the first Gulf War. Uh, so the conscience, uh, the, the the Truth Commission on Conscience and War, has a couple of aims. The first one, as a Truth Commission, similar to the one in South Africa, Peru, Chile, there's uh, been a couple here, is simply to give a space for uh, often muted or silenced voices to, to have their, their day. Uh, and so in that sense, there are going to be four vets, including myself and uh, three, other pe or, yeah, three other people from the, the trailer. There's also going to be uh, legal uh, experts, health specialists, religious leaders, uh, 
focusing on this issue of conscience and war and how do we go about securing the freedom of conscience from a you know kind of a legal uh, structural right. frame mm -hmm. uh, framework but also as church people we'll, and we'll also have uh, Jewish and Muslim perspectives as well from a religious standpoint how do we wrestle with uh, a nation that only recognizes strict pacifism which is an extreme min minority but every faith group every major faith group has mm -hmm. um, just war principles similar to what are commonly uh, understood but the U.S. doesn't actually formally recognize what would amount to selective conscientious objection, or SCO. Uh, and so we're just uh, having this uh, commission to explore uh, the possibilities, the limitations um, uh, in, in enacting uh, law like that. Sure. Um, so what do you think are, um, the, I mean, is the, the overall goal to perhaps change the law? Uh, the, the regulations on and, and including SCO or selective conscientious objectives? The long term goal, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and we, this work is not just beginning on the 21st, it's actually begun uh, in the Supreme Court and earlier with Gillette v. U.S. in 1967, mm -hmm. 66, 67. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes in Vietnam, if, if somebody even registered as a CO to the draft board, they would be sent uh, often voluntarily mm -hmm. uh, to combat as a medic, an unarmed medic. Uh, so part of my ex part of what my hopes are is that we revive that heritage. Uh, we have three Congressional Medal of Honor winners who are also COs, in, uh, two in Vietnam and one in World War II, who was Desmond Doss, and I think he's still living. The other two in Vietnam were both killed in action, saving the lives of their platoon members without a weapon. Wow. Uh, so I'm trying to my my hope is that we'll we'll kind of uh, reground ourselves around that understanding of. of duty and service and patriotism. Um, but I do think that you can address uh, the issue of conscience without uh, exploring how to actually allow the, that exercise to, um, to come to fruition in public square. So actually, um, could you explain a little bit about, um, it's, to me it sounds like there are varying degrees or perhaps even a spectrum. So you have um, pacifism on one right. end and you have this could you explain the the realm of, or what are the parameters for selective conscientious okay uh, right now in um, ethical terms there's uh, there is a, a scale from we'll say pacifism uh, to just war to preemptive war or none of the above um, none of the above is like w there are no rules in war um, right. all fair all is fair in love and war that's kind of the right. far end of the spectrum even right. though we don't really associate it with it mm -hmm. so right now the US government and the, the military regulations, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, only recognizes that far end of the spectrum, pacifism, mm -hmm. which is objection to all war, any mm -hmm. form. But there's two different ways you can go about it. You can request discharge or you can request uh, for reassignment duties. And you're often not allowed to re-enlist if you're one of the, the second uh, set of objectives, um, the parameters. So um, selective conscientious objection would ground in law or regulation the idea that each individual service member um, is able and empowered to uh, dictate their, their understanding of their ability to serve in a, in a given context. Now there's a gut check reaction to that. People immediately assume everybody's going to get out of the military. Right. That's not really the case. Right. Even strict pacifism, the burden of proof is on the applicant. Uh, the average uh, processing time is no less than nine months. The highest rate of processing time I think is right now in the Marines. Um, but that, that would still be in place. W somebody could not raise their hand one morning in formation and say, you guys are going, but I'm going to sit back here and play video games for 15 months or 12 months. So that's one thing that we need to make sure is kind of on the table. This is not an easy process. I thought it was, for those that achieved it, it was one of the most difficult ways to get out. I mean, you could, you could piss hot, you could drink yourself stupid, or you could spend nine months arguing with your superiors about whether or not you're a CEO. Um, so uh, that's, that's essentially what we're working with is, is looking, I, I don't even know if specifically is the right term, but one of the major focuses as we talk about conscience and war is this huge shortcoming in our legal framework that doesn't allow uh, the freedom of expre religious expression, freedom of conscience, mm -hmm. even though our founding fathers were very clear, like James Madison said, the conscience is the number one you know, link between man and God, and, and to violate that is to violate no less than you know, one's religion itself. Okay, thank you for clarifying that whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, because as you said, right now, we don't have selective conscientious objection. Um, actually, if we were to, what do you think would, what would be the outcome of something like that? Um, I don't think it's gonna happen overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm tempted to go into my own personal 
beliefs, but I think I would probably spend too much time on there. But it, I think it is possible that the legal parameters exist. Um, in uh, Gillette v. U.S., uh, Justice Douglas said uh, in his dissent, the only dissent, it was an eight to one decision, which is uh, you know, a steep hill to climb. But uh, he said that essentially uh, Gillette and this other guy, um, Negre, I think, they were both very devout Catholics. And at least as, as early as Vatican II in 1962, um, in Gaudium et Spes, uh, they talk about how everybody has a duty to obey their conscience. Mm -hmm. that, that is the, the, where man uh, enters into the depths of his own being and is, is present with God at that moment. Uh, and so in his dissent, he said, look, we can't, he associated um, refusing SCO on a legislative or, or judicial uh, mm -hmm. side as interfering with one's free exercise of religion. So we have, we have that kind of framework, but I think we will need to acquire the political will, and I think we also need to, um, just like, I mean, right now, DADT, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, is going over in the military. Mm -hmm. There is no shortage of opposition to this very idea, even though mm -hmm. I think on, on its basic principles, everybody accepts, like, yeah, you can't, you can't tell someone they don't have the ability to decide for themselves what is good or, right. or evil or right or wrong. Right. Um, so I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's a big plate to be served, but um, I think it's a long kind of uh, process. I think the Truth Commission is just one of many uh, you know, um, steps in that direction, I think. Okay. So when do you think it's important to have this Truth Commission on conscience and war at this time? Uh, well, the... The most immediate need, uh, if we're speaking from a, an American perspective, is um, this last year, <clears throat> this last year, uh, more soldiers killed themselves than were killed in combat. Uh, that is a crisis of conscience. You don't kill yourself without believing that you're a monster for some reason or another. Right. Um, uh, Jeffrey Lucy, I think it might, I might be getting the first name wrong, but um, Private Lucy was a Marine. Um, came home and he was writing his sister about, you know, don't you understand I'm a monster? And right. uh, he was obviously somebody who objected morally somewhere internally to what he was asked to do. But this, this, this um, uh, conceptual bludgeon we use against our service members of you signed a contract and that obligates you to moral, right. uh, uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work. Uh, Lucy's parents found him with a garden hose around his neck in their own basement. Um, I mean, that is the, the most immediate need that I see. But also, coming back from my trip to Iraq, the, other, the secondary audience to this kind of truth commission is any uh, people or nation receiving end of military force overseas. Right. Um, and so they have a stake in, in reinforcing individual uh, moral agency. Right. Um, I mean, the Nuremberg principle number four states the, the same thing. And that's where we get this idea of, you know, uh, legitimate, perceived legitimate authority telling you to do something does not free you up from the responsibility of doing it. Right. And so this paradigm of a good German is something we really need to make sure we're doing everything to remain outside of. Right. But that includes telling people that, like when I was in basic, you're not paid to think. Um, and then when we deploy, when I deployed, uh, we were told your, your duty is to obey, disobey lawful, unlawful orders. But how can you do that if you don't have the agency to think? Right. And so there's this duplicity that I think we have to overcome. Okay. So this, um, the loss of agency to think, I think creates perhaps a cognitive dissonance in service members that might cause a psychic rift. Absolutely. Right, right. Um, just to go back to that, because I think that that's something very interesting about um, I think first and foremost, this commission is for the people who are the, I mean, perpetrator, the perpetrators of this violence. And um, I'm wondering if you could uh, speak to that because there was something that you had wrote, written um, in one of your blogs about that, about this um, dividing grief that, that in some way um, the, the ability for veterans to speak is very important um, in order to share this grief with everyone else about what's happening. And I'm just wondering if you could yeah, the, on that. Yeah, a blog I wrote recently on. Um, feraltheology.wordpress.com. Uh, it was actually in response to this, uh, my trip to Iraq, and I had been speaking with a friend about uh, this very issue, and it was actually about, I think, affirmative action, and I realized that we either um, accept the, you know, we accept discrimination for good purposes or bad, or we don't. And it just kind of got me thinking on the, on terms of conscience and war. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you steal that from someone, 
uh, that, that's a de debilitating uh, emotional, spiritual, psychiatric blow. I mean, the, the moral injury is a term that was recently co coined by a new um, uh, report that's coming out that actually one of the writers is going to be at the, the Truth Commission. Um, and so I think that one of the, the great um, possibilities with Selective CO is that service members would be able to continue to um, you know, remain in service to their country, either through you know, remaining in the military or you know, in national alter alternative service or something. Um, I think that that would prevent those kinds of uh, psychiatric injuries. I mean, that's the number one concern that we have is PTSD and everything. And if, if PTSD, PTSD is not in some way caused by conscience, I don't know what is right. or what possibly could be causing it. I mean, I don't know, I could speculate, but I probably shouldn't. Uh, and in my blog, I realized that, um, you know, when, when there, this cognitive disconnect occurs, that is, when, that is the first moment at which we stop seeing one another as, uh, as part of a human family. We stop seeing each other as, as brother or sister or kin. Um, and I'm, like a, I'm kind of an idealist, but I think that's, that's really how we should be viewing one another is, right. is if I can't do it to my brother or sister, why, why would I do it to you? Right, right. So, yeah. Well, um, what was interesting about, um, if, if you take a look at the, the website on the Truth Commission, one of its um, purposes also was to build bridges between the, it says, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. to build bridges between a military community and the peace community. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that, because I, I find that a very um, intriguing concept of, of if, if that's even possible, of bridging a, the military community and a peace community. Yeah. Uh, the three goals of the commission officially are to honor and safeguard the freedom of conscience for service members, repair explore and repair moral injury and spiritual injury and then of course also to build bridges between pacifist just war just peace right. uh, different camps um and uh i was kind of in a, a bind when i decided to be a co uh because i didn't necessarily kind of accept out of hand or um you know right away this idea that you know the military is evil and you just have to get out of it right. I, I knew guys that joined for very altruistic reasons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some of them before 9 11 like myself were after um and even that, I think, is to, to jump to that kind of conclusion immediately does the same kind of damage as, as saying, well, you're an Iraqi, so I can aim my weapon at you. Um, and so I do think that there, in, in certain circumstances, there is a, a, a divide to be bridged between the peace community um, and, and military members. We, I don't know, I think it, it strips a person of their unique humanity to say, well, you're a person who's in the military, and that's all you'll ever be. You'll only ever be as good as your, your, the uniform that you wore. Right. Um, and that just seems, um, I don't know, I, I can't accept that any more than I accepted what I, I was conditioned to believe. And I didn't you know, elect like, oh, Iraqis are just, they, they don't matter. But ultimately that's what, that's what I had to believe in order to go to combat. Right. Okay, well, we're, we're nearing almost the end of our time here. So I wanted to ask you about what you hope to accomplish by going to New York at the Riverside Church and um, what do you hope to bring back? Uh, for me, as part of my organization, I'm, um, Centurions Guild is something I co-founded in 2008, and we're a co-sponsor. We're also going to be live blogging the event, uh, conscienceandwar.org, um, or centuriansguild.org, one of the two. We haven't really figured it out. But I really want just people to talk about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've already been announcing the, uh, the event in class. I've gotten some really uh, colorful conversations, but <laughs> all of them very good. Uh, and personally, I just, I love talking about this stuff. I can talk for hours about ethics <laughs> and war. Um, but really, I think it's a discussion at the national level that, that needs to take place. Um, and so what I hope to do is that people um, log in to, to watch our live blogging, centurionsguild.org. Uh, you know, look at the trailer. Uh, they've already seen it. But there will be continual uh, kind of updates and content as we have the event. But also the, the event itself is really the inauguration of a period of, of discernment and digestion and right. reflection nationally, right. hopefully, um, of these issues. Uh, the event on the 21st will collect testimony from the testifiers, the expert witnesses, mental health specialists. And uh, the following day, behind in a private session, uh, testifiers and commissioners will be discussing what you heard, uh, what we do with that, and how do we move forward, and what are we willing to commit to. And so once that is collected on the 22nd, that'll open up a six-month uh, period where these questions are going to be asked. We're, we're, uh, this morning I was on the call with uh, 
um, Christian organization, so, uh, progressive Christian organization, uh, talking about their participation. Uh, Riverside Church donated in kind several thousands of dollars just to use the space for free. Right. So this is this is big. I think people um, will get excited about that, and hopefully they'll you know find it through my blog, through uh, conscienceandwar.org, centurionsguild.org. Uh, I mean, I have I have people on Twitter, uh, Facebook. You know, could go on and on, but really the idea is to get people talking about it so that it, you know that cognitive dissonance can be repaired, so that people begin to look at soldiers. Uh, as more than just uniforms on either side of the aisle. Right. I mean, the right does it too, and that, that's where this argument, well, you signed a contract and right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, the contract was the, is the only enforceable contract in the entire body of law that is only um, binding to one side. Right. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Right. So I think that's really the goal is through conversation, through dialogue, that we begin to see service members as more than just, um, I guess now it's gray, but it used to be green and brown and black or blue and, um, yeah, really just humanizing uh, the military for the benefit of the U.S. And also, I think, by extension, uh, those who have suffered at the hands of, of our very own military. Actually, then it, that actually brought up a question that I have about then whether or not Iraqis would be a part of this Truth Commission. Uh, I've invited a couple of commissioners. Um, as, as a co-sponsor, we invite commissioners, and there are certain obligations. Most of those I've invited who are dual nationality or something are not going to be in the country, unfortunately. But um, at least through my efforts, I know that I'll be trying to make sure that this kind of testimony, these stories get told uh, even uh, in Iraq or to Iraqis. One thing that I'm, I'm trying to tackle that is still in development mode um, is uh, collecting more stories that we can't fit into this four-hour time period on the 21st. So we're, we're soliciting service members to contact me, logan.org and video, audio, or written testimony that will be submitted to the kind of broader archive that Union, is, Union Theological Seminary will be, will be holding for us. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Darlene Rodriguez signing off. We'll probably do another segment with uh, Logan when he returns in March um, after the Truth Commission. Mahalo for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>